This is our Sunday School lesson, lesson number 13 for November the 26th, 2013. This is from Unit 3, and it is the last lesson of our fall quarter. It is entitled, From the Faith Pathway Study Manual, Promises to Remember, and it is also from the Bible Expository and Illuminator. It's also re, uh, titled, Remembering the Covenant. Our devotional reading for our lesson is Colossians, the first chapter, verses 9 through 20. Our background scripture is 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, and also Jude, verse 3. And our printed passage is 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verses 23 through 34. And our key verse in the NIV reads, In the same way, after supper he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, in my blood this do whenever you drink it in remembrance of me and this is first corinthians the 11th chapter and the 25th verse and our lessons aims are to explore the meaning of the lord's supper at the time of covenant remembrance to aspire to eat the lord's supper in a worthy manner and also to live out the daily covenant implications of the Lord's Supper. As always, when we look into the significance of the Word of God as revealed to us through the Bible, we look at its social contents, uh, we look at the social implications and the conditions through which the scripture is being revealed, uh, looking at the background of the text. And we realize that in Paul's letter, in the first book of Corinthians, it was addressing a, I should say, some common factors that we find in uh, not just the historical and biblical social uh, behavior and conduct of the day, but uh, far-reaching uh, into even our current social conditions and behaviors. And so uh, as we look at the significance of remembering the promises of the covenant, and we look at what the Lord's Supper is to remind us of and cause us to reflect upon. We also look at the backdrop of this and see what then are some of the requirements of the Lord's Supper that are revealed to us from the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, uh, from verses 23 through 34. As we entertain those, we look at uh, against what? What are the imposing things that made these words so significant? So we recognize that there was disunity, there were, was dissension in the church at the time uh, among the people, among the believers, that there was uh, issues concerning morality, uh, people's values, uh, their conviction to the things that they were proclaiming, that there were also issues centered around instability in marriages, uh, also the freedoms that uh, the church also had and uh, 
not taking into serious content the uh, action or the activity of those freedoms. And so when we look at some of the conditions that are in the backdrop and superimposed onto the lesson, uh, we recognize then why the words that are spoken here uh, have more significance if we put them in association with what are the pre-existing conditions and why do these things that are revealed and brought out to us in scripture, uh, why are they so rele relevant and uh, what is the severity of why these things are being spoken? Uh, so uh, one thing we would like to cite uh, as Paul starts out in the 23rd verse is uh, first it says, for I have received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was portrayed, took the bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then following that, he also took the cup and said, this represents my blood. And whenever you drink this, you do this in remembrance of me. Um, what we would like to cite on this here is, is that Christ establishes a practice, a ceremony, a institution that is far reaching back into the beginning books of the Bible coming from Exodus when the people were freed from bondage going all the way to the New Testament when we receive a practice that has historical and cultural implications to it still being admonished still being um, being revealed as a ritual or as a ceremony of great significance that even though Christ was being portrayed that he did not lose sight of the importance of establishing this institution when we think of sometimes our uh, challenges as well as misfortunes and even uncomfortable situations we find ourselves in, sometimes we become so preoccupied and overwhelmed by misfortunes and uncomfortable incidents that occur in our lives that we lose sight of the things of significance and importance. But here, although this institution being established on the eve, on the night where Christ was being portrayed, he did not lose sight of the significance or the value or the importance of establishing this sacred institution in spite of what he realized he was encountering himself to set forth for us that in spite of the challenges, the, uh, insig uh, the issues that we face, that we should not lose sight of the things that are established upon certain fundamental and foundational purposes that are to reassure us and to strengthen us and to encourage us when we find ourselves overwhelmed or find ourselves preoccupied with the other realities in life that also come upon us. There is also symbolism that has deeper implications that are lifted in our lesson 
uh, when we speak of the bread being symbolic of the body of Christ, when we speak of the wine representing the blood, uh, we rep we rec recognize and also realize that through Scripture that Christ had been come related or had been identified with other aspects or entities in life or elements, if we were, that we are familiar with to lift a higher purpose that Christ represented, such as in John 6 and 35, we find that Christ is revealed or spoken in the light of I am the bread of life. Uh, we find in John 9 and 5 where it says, I am the light of the world. And in John 10 and 7, that I am the door. And in John 15 and 1, I am the true vine. So many times Christ is revealed to us in aspects that are things we are very much familiar with in our daily living, uh, but that they also serve vital functions. Uh, we know that the eating of bread, even in conditions concerning our health, is required to provide for our bodies the fiber and the nutrients that are contained in the grain and the wheat to provide those certain nutrients for our bodies. And then when it says the bread of life, uh, those nutrients provide uh, certain essential vitamins that our body needs for the fulfillment of life. Uh, we know that as we speak of the light, that light brings forth light. It brings forth a awakening. It brings forth understanding. It brings forth direction. Uh, life in itself uh, is symbolic with light because the light of the sun causes all living organisms uh, to actually mature into being transformed from one form of being into another. And so we recognize that symbolically speaking, when we talk about Christ and identify Christ as the body and the blood. If we look at our lessons centered today in chapter 11, but if we would read chapter 10 prior to chapter 11 in 1 Corinthians, and then look also at chapter 12, which talks about the spiritual body talks about the gifts of the body. Then we begin to see that these things are working. These scriptures are working in concert. They begin to identify the things that brings disunity in the body of Christ in verse 10 or in chapter 10, which we will lift uh, shortly then it also begins to expound upon us how that we can bring that disorder to order in 11. And then once we are orderly, it tells us how these gifts have been given to the body and identified in different aspects to support the body of Christ. Let's look at 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, to identify what uh, is required of us as we uh, partake of the sacred practice of the communion. In verse 16, 1 Corinthians, the 10th verse, it says to us, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion 
of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? So it expounds upon us that this blessing of the bread and of the blood represents the communion, the relationship that we have with Christ. Then it goes on to say, for we, though we are many, are one bread and one body. Even though there is diversity among us, even though no, no two of us are the same, yet we are all under the same governance, the same following, the same instructions and requirements through the belief in the body of Christ. And it says that we are one body for we are all partakers of that one bread. And it goes on to say, observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifice partakers of the altar? And it recognizes that maybe this is confusing. So let me clear it up. And it says in verse 19, what I am saying then, that an idol is anything or what is offered to idols is anything. So it doesn't have to be a statue. It doesn't have to represent some kind of demonic form. But if if it's not, it, it, it doesn't have to be made of a certain metal. It, uh, because it's made of gold doesn't make it an idol. Uh, because it's made of silver doesn't make it uh, a, a practice of idolatry. Uh, it, because it's made of a certain uh, species of wood doesn't make it a certain item. It is when the observation, when the recognition of this item is not rendered unto a sacred or holy or meaningful or positive uh, practice rendered unto God, the God of creation, then that item becomes something where it is a distraction. It's a deviation from that which is holy and acceptable unto God. This is what makes it idol worship. And then he goes on to tell us that in verse 20, rather that these things which the Gentiles, those that are unbelievers, the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. They sacrifice to things that they have established as these things are worthy of our praise, worthy of our attention, worthy of our uh, uh, obedience unto. Rather, though our practices are godly or not, rather than our, um, our belief and behavior is godly or not. It does not matter. But these are the things that we recognize and our practices. This is where the distinction must be made that the believers practice cannot be equal to or in any light relative to the same practices of non-believers. So it goes on and it tells us that they sacrifice unto demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons or negativity or non-constructive practices. So it says you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. Or do we want to provoke the Lord to anger? Are we stronger than he? 
So when we put things in the proper context and look at what practices were being uh, uh, actually uh, what behaviors were actually being manifested in that time and then look at why is this then brought to us in this in this manner um, uh, when it speaks also about um, our worthy or unworthy practice of the communion uh, in the 11th chapter of first Corinthians I want us to look at what Paul reveals to them in the 17th verse for it reads and this is prior to the verses coming up so and sometimes in order for us to put things in the proper perspective we have to look at the preceding verses how they connect to the current verses that we're that we're lifting and it tells us now, in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. So as we read through 10 and come forward into 11, here is the tone that is set by Paul. He says, since you don't come together for the better, but for the worse, he said, first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. The report had gone forth that when the people were coming together, that they were divided among themselves. There was disunity. As we started the lesson out, and we said one of the factors that was uh, listed in the letter to the Corinthians was the fact that they were not combined together as one, that there were factions among them, that they uh, were not connected, that they were divided. Division breeds confusion. And it says that for there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. So when we have disunity, then there are certain groups that are placed as a higher esteemed group than others in the groups of groupings. So then we begin to have privileged and unprivileged. We have a upper class and a lower class. When we allow dissension and division to take place, it creates havoc and discord. It goes further and it says, therefore, when you come together in one place, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? Do we gather for other issues? When we are disconnected and all assemble ourselves together, well, are we there for other purposes? Well, let's look at how our behavior is when we are gathered together. It says, for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. Now, it does not identify which group it is that uh, before we all collectively, like we just experienced Thanksgiving. And I would uh, wage to say that it was probably a, a general uh, assembly before we begin to um, fix our plates or before we begin to eat the abundance and the provisions that God had placed before us, I would wager to say we probably did an acknowledgement of what the creator had blessed us with all together collectively and even in some of our settings, we allow the elders 
and the children to eat first before the whole grouping. Some of us have certain social and culturalistic practices that we actually manifest just this past Thanksgiving. So here, though, Paul lifts that uh, each one takes his own supper ahead of the others. I'm in verse 21 of chapter 11, 1 Corinthians. And one is hungry and another is drunk. So when he begins to identify that when we come together in one place, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? It is it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. We come for other purposes. It says, what do you not have in your house to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Now let's just listen to how Paul is wording this. He says, and there is an exclamation point behind the what. He says, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? In other words, if you are not going to uh, conform yourself to the order that is established, that we are all one body, we are all the same. When we come before the Lord and we commune together as believers, all a part of the one body identified in the bread and the wine that we uh, practice in our taking at the Lord's communion, at the Lord's supper. In other words, if you can't find within your means to participate in a form that says neither one of us is any different or any greater than another, but we will all govern ourselves by the same requirements. If you can't do these things, then why bring that disorder into a place that requires order. Otherwise, why don't you stay home and manifest that disorder and disconnect and disunity in your own house? But let's not bring that into the Lord's house. Because when we do come to the Lord, are we not coming because we are looking for something that is better than what we are familiar with and frustrated from? So it's saying if you're not going to come and honor that which is to relieve the daily frustrations that we have, then why bring that frustration into a place which is to provide us stability and direction and relief and guidance and love and kindness and forgiveness? These are the things that were brought about into that new covenant where whether we're looking in the eighth chapter of Hebrews or the 10th chapter, if we go all the way back to Jeremiah, where the new covenant says that I will put my spirit into their minds and into their hearts. And I will remember their sins, their iniquity, their negative vibes, their impractical practices. I will remember those no more. But I will take them and move them forward. So as we look at what is lifted in our lesson. Now, I want to close on this one uh, issue. And this is about uh, where the scripture tells us in our lesson that whoever drinks uh, unworthy uh, whoever is found uh, not in accordance with what is required, that they bring uh, damnation, damnation upon themselves. I want us to focus on this. Because a lot of times we make the association that 
um, the all loving, the all wise, the all knowing God, forgiving and and uh, uh, exemplifying at all times love and kindness and a spirit of parenting and father and mothering to all of creation. But a lot of times uh, we say that, well, then if all of that is true, then why is it that I'm encountering all of these things, uh, all of these bad things that go on in life? Uh, and here, so it says uh, in the 27th verse that if we take of this bread and of this uh, wine, then unworthy that uh, we bring damnation upon ourselves. And I want us to, a you know, familiar passage, I know we're all familiar with uh, the book of John, the third chapter and verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I know we're quite familiar with that. Uh, but in verse 17, it says that for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This right here kind of goes right in line with, and their sins I will remember no more because I provided for them. My son, I provided for them salvation. I provide, provided for them deliverance from the heaviness of the world. But it then says that he who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Then it gives us a good analogy of what the condemnation is based upon. And it says, this is the condemnation that the light direction, freedom from oppression, a lifting of the heaviness that constructive and positive vibes were presented in the light and it has come into the world and man loves darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. This is what brings the condemnation. I hope that through uh, observing other scriptures relative to our text today, that something has been said, that something has been lifted that would bring our understanding and our awareness and our comprehension of what the significance of the communion service and that sacred institution that was established. I hope something came forth that verifies it and makes it of a more significance than what we already have obtained. God bless you and God keep you.